Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is for the first three months of 2015. It's a series on the book of Proverbs. We've had a lot of fun with Proverbs. And this is a lesson on the last chapter, Proverbs 31. And you may know that it talks about women and wine. That ought to be it. You only do you know something about <laughs> women and wine? <laughs> okay, we're going to have fun with this one. Um, but before we begin, I hope you have your Bible handy. We will uh, begin with the word of prayer. Our loving Father, with great appreciation, we open your word once again to consider the contents, to think about the words of wisdom that you have provided us here in this book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. Help us to understand them and explain them to the best we are able for those who are listening. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know, Proverbs is full of a lot of wisdom. And we're now coming to the end of it. And it's interesting to notice in Proverbs 31, the first verse, these are the solemn words which King Lemuel's mother said to him. And my first question is, how many other places in the Bible are written by women? No, no, no. Anybody? Well, was the Song of Miriam written by Miriam or just sung by her? It's called the Song of Moses in Revelation. Yeah. I, I'm speaking of back in Exodus. Yeah, no, I know, but that same song is, is, is called the Song of Moses and the Lamb. So I, I don't, and Moses for sure was the one who wrote it down. So as far, I, I think this is the only part of Scripture where it specifically says it was written by or, or written, you know, whether composed, we don't know, but at least written down apparently by a woman. Well, some believe that the name Lemuel is a code name for Solomon, and if that's true, this would mean who was the author of this chapter? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yeah, David's special wife. Um, do you think she knew anything about the wiles of women? Uh, I'm sure she did. <laughs> well, did she find herself competing with uh, however many other wives he had uh, for his, his attentions? I don't know. Well, do you think there's a deliberate association in this chapter between wine and women? I think all of us have heard some time or another the old adage about how you can have this wonderful world that's full of wine, women, and song. Well, no, there's, there's no song in this chapter, I don't think, but there is poetry. This is a, this is a poem. So, uh, I don't know, would, would this be the first wine, women, and song thing? Isn't wine and women kind of an alliteration? Why not? You know, this sounds good. <laughs> well, if you remember back to our first lesson, that was primarily focused on the advice of a father to his children. And here we come to the end of Proverbs and we have the advice from a mother to her son. Is that intentional? I think yes, but I think on the other hand, we know in our paradigm, our lifetimes, that there's plenty of men and women gotten themselves into trouble with alcohol. Yeah, yeah. Well, we know, all of us would recognize in this culture at least and in other developed cultures that the alcohol producers, the people who make the, the beer and the wine and the strong drink and so forth, they want us to think that alcohol is associated with the good life. Where did that idea come from? Time immemorial. <laughs> Been around a long time. Think about how much money goes into promoting alcohol. Yeah. I mean, look at the the Super Bowl ads, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, this is just a classical example in our country where there's the biggest advertising campaigns in the in the in the whole year, and a good share of them are about alcohol. You know, I don't think alcohol needs that much advertising. It just advertises itself. I think on the 
Super Bowl. There's just different makes that want them to well, sure. bring their alcohol. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and they have fancy bottles and they have fancy ad campaigns and so forth. You remember that we had um, some very interesting words about alcohol back in Proverbs 23, uh, starting with verse 30. Look at this for just a moment. We start actually with verse 29. Show me someone who drinks too much who has to try out some new drink, and I will show you someone miserable and sorry for himself, always causing trouble and always complaining. His eyes are bloodshot, and he's, he has bruises that could have been avoided. Don't let wine tempt you, even though it is rich red, though it sparkles in the cup, and it goes down smoothly. The next morning you will feel as if you've been bitten by a poisonous snake. Weird sights will appear before your eyes, and you will not be able to think or speak clearly. You will feel as if you are out on the ocean, seasick, swinging high up in the rigging of a tossing ship. I must have been hit, you will say. I must have been beaten up, but I don't remember it. Why can't I wake up? I need another drink. And that's so true of the typical alcoholic. RSV in verse 33 says, The eyes will see strange things and your mind will utter perverse things. <laughs> yeah, How many times you sure. people? Well, look at the verses that we're talking about in terms of alcohol. Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, and then we skip over 6 and 7 and read verses 8 and 9. 4 and 5, Listen, Lemuel, kings should not drink wine or have a craving for alcohol. When they drink, they forget the laws and ignore the rights of people in need. Now, don't read verses 6 and 7. We'll come to those later. <laughs> Verse 8 and 9. Speak up for people who cannot speak for themselves. Protect the rights of all who are helpless. Speak for them and be a righteous judge. Protect the rights of the poor and needy. That's from my Good News translation that I use quite frequently on this program. So what's being suggested by these verses? Under certain circumstances, they obviously used it. Didn't at that time see a whole lot of trouble doing it, but... Well, you're definitely not in your right mind when you're under the influence. Yeah. And if you're, if you're a leader, that's bad news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are expecting wisdom out of your mouth. It may not come. Uh, the concern for others may be totally gone. And actually, the concern for your own well-being might be gone, too. Yes. Yeah, people try crazy things when they're under the influence of alcohol. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is wa listen to the news to, to realize that. All you have yeah. to do is sit in an emergency room for a while. Yes. And the sad part, and a lot of people don't realize this, but statistically, 7% of the people who taste alcohol for the first time will end up being alcoholics. Wow. I'm it's like Russian roulette. Yeah. I'm surprised it's that low. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're talking about all-out alcoholics. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's not we're talking not talking about drinkers or people who souse themselves once in a while. Another stat is here in California. That's where the study was done. Um, they, you might think, well, people drink, they get arrested on the road, right? They found out that Three, there are 300 occasions of driving drunk or driving at least in beyond the legal limit for every time that somebody's arrested. 300 to 1. Terrifying. Well, that raises questions about verses 6 and 7 that we skipped over. Look at those verses. Proverbs 31, 6 and 7. Alcohol is for people who are dying, for those who are in misery. Let them drink and forget their poverty and unhappiness. So does that mean alcohol is for a certain kind of people and we had to reserve it, reserve it for them? What about drugs or whatever that you give to people to yeah. re relieve their pain or, yeah. or whatever con uh, medical condition they may have, or even psychological conditions? Yeah. Well, I, I have to chuckle when I talk to people about alcohol and they want to know, you know, think about where it comes from and what's its purpose. How's alcohol produced? Well, they use grains and put water we, we in. Take, we take good, very good food. Yeah. Usually it's food with a fairly high um, sugar, content. sugar content. We put an organism in called yeast. The yeast grows rapidly with that sugar 
and it produces, uh, basically it grows, and it produces a waste product that turns out to be alcohol. So what do we do? We, when we get done, we remove all the, the growth. We, we take the yeast, sometimes they purify the yeast and dry it out and sell it as brewer's yeast, and we drink the waste product. Just, so don't well, I don't. <laughs> don't include me, but I mean, we as human beings, that's what we do. Well, what do we know about what happens to people when they drink? In terms of their brains and so forth. Oxidizes their brain. Years ago, I saw a sagittal section where they cut through the brain, mm -hmm. and so the the convolutions are, com and the grayish greenish matter between them. It was really gross compared to to a, a healthy brain. Was kind of like uh, yeah. large curdled cottage cheese. Yeah, the, the the pathologists who deal with brains all the time will look at a brain almost immediately, and they will tell you this is an alcoholic because the what are supposed to be, the brain's supposed to go like this, and there's supposed to be a deep dip, and back up, and then a deep dip like this, and the alcoholics there, the, the, the dips are, are spaced like that, because a whole lot of brain tissue is gone. Yeah, called atrophy. Atrophy, yeah. yeah. It, it depends a bit on what they drink and how much, but in the end, all of it will get you to yeah. drink enough. Yeah. Uh, the spirits with a higher, higher octane, as I sort of crudely put it, They'll fry you a lot quicker than a lot of beer, but there are beers around, enough of it'll do oh, it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> the saddest part I find is pregnant women who drink. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. And their children. Oh, well, there's a, there's a syndrome behind that. There are kids born. You can pick them out when they come through some of the mental institutions right yeah. off, just looking at them. Yeah. Well, what happens when people drink is it starts to put to sleep or be numb the front parts of your brain first and then gradually back further and further and further until if you drink enough and you get enough down before you stop drinking, it'll actually stop you from breathing. Yeah. If not, most people collapse before they get that much into them and then they wonder what happened to them the next morning. Well, that's, the alcohol attacks the portion where, where your critical thinking goes on, right? Mm -hmm. And so then as a result, your God's capacity to communicate to you is greatly uh, crippled. Yeah. Uh, the, er the areas of inhibition, of the normal yes. inhibitions are, are lost yeah. with alcohol quickly. Sounds like judgment. a neurologist speaking to me. Yeah, could be. <laughs> now, there's also acute alcohol intoxication that yeah. causes acute vitamin deficiencies that yeah. cause some major problems. Yes. Yeah. Well, we know that in his, history, uh, there are times when kings or leaders, military leaders, some people like that have made terrible mistakes uh, when they were partially or quite considerably drunk. Uh, and the modern example, the really serious modern example was the Yalta Conference when they made some really bad decisions um, under the uh, influence, partially under the influence of alcohol. Bad decisions for some turned out to be Good decisions for others. Yeah. <laughs> another example. By is, accident. Yeah. Another, Wasn't it? Go ahead. Another example is apparently uh, Alexander the Great, at the age of what was it, 33 or so, yeah. apparently drunk himself to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and we know that if you drink and drive, you not only put yourself at risk, you put other people at risk who are on the road. Yeah. Do we have a right to quote? enjoy ourselves by taking alcohol, recognizing that we have the distinct possibility of damaging ourselves and potentially killing other people. Is, do we have that right? Well, there's a very serious story about alcohol drinking found way back in the early part of the Bible in Leviticus verses 10, verses 9 and, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Let's have a look at that. Lord said, to Aaron, you, Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons are not to enter the temple temp of my presence after drinking wine or beer. If you do, you will die. This is a law to be kept by all your descendants. And if you read the verses up ahead of that, what happened? Aaron's two oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his fire pan, put live coals on it, added incense, and presented it to the Lord. But this fire was not holy because the Lord had not commanded them to present it. Suddenly the Lord sent fire and it burned them to death in the presence of the Lord. Now, some people might think that's a uh, 
terrible abuse of God's power, other people like me would say, God wanted them to take this seriously. They have been given very clear instructions, and these are people who thought, well, God's instructions aren't too serious. I can do it the way I want to do it. I don't have to do it God's way. And this is what happened. Well, I, I don't think I have to tell anybody who has any experience in the healthcare field that um, if you've been at it for very long, you've had to deal with people who had problems because of their alcohol. Yeah. Uh, Can I share a story? Yeah. My first day in clinical services as a medical student was at a uh, nearby county hospital, and I volunteered to be on call that first day. I was on general surgery. Oh and in the relatively early afternoon, got a call to the emergency room, and the whole team went down there, several teams, and there's this young guy, not that young, probably in his 30s, but seemed young at the time, um, younger now, and he was been on a motorcycle, he had his leather jacket on, and he had a flask of alcohol in one pocket and beer bo a bottle in another, and he was totally intoxicated, and he'd fallen off his mi mo motorcycle, or had a motorcycle crash, and the whole front of his head was just smashed in. Mm. There was nothing they could do. You know, it looked okay, but it was just mush, just soft. No, he'd done it. He killed himself. Yeah. Well, my story is a little different than that. I, I will never forget this. As a child, I was in grade school, and my father was a doctor, and we were driving home from visiting some friends early, I would say, on a Saturday evening. And we were driving along this dark road in northern Idaho, and here was this gal with high heels on, just stumbling along, completely drunk. You know, like, and my father, you know, he, he said, man, we, we can't just leave her alone like that. So he stopped to see what the deal was, see if we could help her. We actually ended up carrying her to the closest town, the village, so she could try to get some help. She had gotten pregnant for the first time when she was 12 years old and had twins. And now she was about 15 or 16 and she was pregnant again. And she was drunk as could be. And I, I just, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, just as a young kid, I thought, what in the world is this lady doing with those kids? Mm -hmm. Just they had no chance, did they? Well, is there ever a time when alcohol is an appropriate thing to use? Well, it's a good way to give skin them surface for a shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't it a good way to dispense medicine into the body? Well, there are some medicines that the only thing they will, they will, you can, you can get them to absorb in or, or to disperse in is alcohol. So they, there are some medicines that have a small amount of alcohol just to, f to carry the medicine. Yeah, that's true. Many parts of uh, blue zones in other countries, uh, they attest to the fact that they, be, they really believe that they drink a little bit of white, red wine with their dinner and that is, you know, that kind of helped the fact that they've lived so long. What we know from ancient times, of course, is that um, they had no anesthesia, they had no pain medicines, nothing like we have today, and sometimes even for pregnant women who, who were having a lot of pain, a lot of problems with their with deliveries, they would get them really drunk and then they would do a real fast surgery, tie them down and do a real fast surgery, get the baby out, I mean, with no more anesthesia. That's the only anesthesia they had. I mean, can you imagine having a C-section with no anesthesia except a bottle of wine or something like that? You bleed more? Not necessarily. Uh, well, they were using that here and there in the Civil War, too. Yeah. It was not unknown. Well, an anesthesia, remember, was just discovered just before the Civil War. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So maybe in ancient times... Uh, there were a few instances someone was dying of cancer and having just a horrendous amount of pain. Might have been appropriate to use a little bit of alcohol. Well, one of the things that always makes me sad when I hear about it really is that we, we read all these articles in the medical literature and it's in the public press. All you, you, you ought to have a small amount of wine every day with your meals because it's good for your heart. And of course, they don't mention the fact that it fries your brain and it fries your liver. You never hear them talk about the brain or the liver. It's just good for your heart, right? 
And uh, I can tell you that there was a young lady who said, well, what is it about the alcohol that's good for your heart? And she did a study here at Loma Linda University and found out that good, pure water works even better. Right. <laughs> so it probably has more to do with the water that's in the wine than it has to do with the wine itself. Although there is true, uh, there seems to be some benefits from a chemical known as resveratrol, which is in, in red wine. And there's other flavonoids that are probably useful. Well, it comes from the grape. Yeah. It isn't the, you don't need the alcohol no. with the resveratrol. No, no. So no. Buy it without prescription. Just about any supermarket or another. I saw, I saw one of these little, I think, five by seven cards, that you, postcards that you could send to somebody, had a little sign on the back of it. The back was a sign on the right on the other side. I'll never forget it back when I was way when I was just in high school. And it said, don't drink, troubles can swim. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People talk to, about drowning your troubles. No, troubles can swim. Well, the overall message about, uh, in the, from the book of Proverbs about alcohol is pretty, pretty clear. Um, and it's interesting that it talks about those who are perishing. Maybe you give alcohol to the perishing. Um, some people think that, that perishing there is a, is a reference word to the wicked. And uh, maybe if some people are, are bent on doing evil, uh, they're going to drink whether, whether you like it or not. Who knows? You can, you can read about that. Proverbs 10, 28, 11, 7, and 10, 19, 19, 21, 28, and 28, 28. Get, see what you think those verses mean. Uh, this is not a suggestion that we should give wine to people who are depressed or whatever. It's probably a note just about what's likely to happen in the lives of people who, who do that thing, that kind of stuff. I, I, I think in certain situations back then, and even comparatively recently, it has been done. I saw it once years ago under the lap. This elderly gentleman was not going to survive. He wouldn't drink. And one of the male nurses said, would you like a little stout? Yes, give me a drink of stout. And about an hour later, he died. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't hurt him, but it made him, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. He knew what the man was talking about. Mm -hmm. so and stout uh, is what? It's, it's probably, probably brandy or something like that. No, it's not really. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, mostly in England, not only in England and Ireland, but it's, it's, a, it's, a ver it's not a true beer and it's not a, a high alcohol, but it's, it's made differently and it's apparently got a little different flavor and some yeah. calories in it. I don't know much I about see. it, but... Mm -hmm. Well, where did the I idea of drinking alcohol come from? Some very interesting words by Ellen White in the Review on Herald from April 16, 1901. It's also found in the book Temperance in page 12, paragraph 2. Satan gathered the fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. One proposition after another was made till finally Satan himself thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, also wheat and other things given by God as food, and would convert them into poisons, which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers and so overcome the senses that Satan could have full control. Under the influence of liquor, men would be led to commit crimes of all kinds. Through a perverted appetite, the world would be made corrupt. By leading men to drink alcohol, Satan would cause them to descend lower and lower in the scale. So, there you go. This is conjecture, no? Conjecture? Yeah. Because where oh. does it say that in the Bible, that Satan did? I've never read that. No, no, it's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The only thing, we, the only basis for believing this would be that she saw it in vision. Oh. Because everything we do that hurts us, you know, it's probably, you know, stem from Satan. But I think that we move people, you know, you, you do wrong because you do wrong. We can't say everything is Satan. Yeah. 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 Well, the other thing is that when that was written, we didn't really understand how the body worked. I can assure you that Satan and his angels knows about cell structure. He knows about the nerve endings. He knows about all the chemical reactions and all that. And probably that kind of a conference came and it was down to that level. But 
Yeah. The way he ex she explained it was brought it up to where we could understand it. Yeah. And he also understood addiction and yes. all the implications oh, yes. of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, he learned very pretty quick after experimenting with it a little bit. Well, the major part of the book of, uh, the, of the chapter, yes, did you have a question? Yeah. Do people overeat and become obese and that did Satan did that too? But that's what mm. you're basically saying. Everything yeah. that's bad that well, people do to I'm themselves, just, Satan just plied saying, it with the angel. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but I'm just saying that this was kind of, I shouldn't say dumbed down, <laughs> you know, but um, just put into some sort of Easy language and understand language. back yeah. then that, um, you know, Satan and his angels, they're way more smarter than what was the, the Bible tells us there. we were made a little lower than the angels, and look what we've done with our finite minds. Yeah. You know somebody of, of the devil's uh, Got a hand in that. Yeah. Well, the major part of this chapter, Proverbs 31, is a story of a capable or a virtuous wife. It's a wonderful story. I'm going to actually read parts of it. How hard it is, starting from verse 10 of Proverbs 31, how hard it is to find a capable wife. She is worth far more than jewels. Her husband puts his confidence in her and he will never be poor. As long as she lives, she does him good and never harm. She keeps her bu herself busy making wool and linen cloth. She brings home food from out of the way places as merchant ships do. She gets up before daylight to prepare food for her family and to tell her servant women what to do. She looks at land and buys it and with money she has earned, she plants a vineyard. She's a hard worker, strong and industrious. She knows the value of everything she makes and works late into the night. So doesn't, she doesn't, much get, doesn't get much sleep here. <laughs> she spins her own threads and weaves her own cloth. She is generous to the poor and needy. She doesn't worry when it snows because her family has warm clothing. She makes bedspreads and wears clothes of fine purple linen. Her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens. She makes clothes and belts and sells them to merchants. She is strong and respected and not afraid of the future. She speaks with a gentle wisdom. She is always busy and looks after her family's needs. Her children show their appreciation and her husband praises her. He says, many women are good wives, but you are the best of them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty disappears, but a woman who honors the Lord should be praised. Give her credit for all she does. She deserves the respect of everyone. So every, every, every woman should bow and be thankful for a presentation like that. Mm -hmm. it, this is a very interesting poem, by the way. What do we know about this poem? It's an acrostic. It's 22 verses. What does that hint to you about? 22, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 alphabet. letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And each, each uh, verse of this starts with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Daleth, Hey, Wow, and so forth the Hebrew alphabet, one by one, so that is known as an acrostic. So it, the, the organization of the chapter is not only beautiful poetry and a beautiful story, it's a very fancy piece of poetry. So it's a really challenge, challenge to the writer to come up with something that will fit in there. Yeah. Yeah. Good memory device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In, Once you got it figured in out. Hebrew, yes, in, in Hebrew. Not in English. <laughs> <laughs> not in English. Yeah. So uh, look at Proverbs. Well, I know we should take time to read all these things. Um, let's pick one. Look at Proverbs 4, verses 5 and 9. 5 to 9. Gentle wisdom and insight. Do not forget or ignore what I say. Do not abandon wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will keep you safe. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. Whatever else you get, get insight. Love wisdom, and she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will bring you honor. She will be your crowning glory. Uh, what's that talking about? Is this just talking about an education? Wisdom is a she? Is wisdom a female? Well, it's similar, similar to what we just read in the 31st chapter of Proverbs. It's a, the, the threads are similar there in the fourth yeah. pattern. We read a lot of... A lot of Ideas similar to that in Proverbs 8, and we suggested there that wisdom might be a code name for Jesus Christ. How does that strike you? I think, I think that is there. 
Yeah. That we we know from Revelation that yeah. woman is a code name for the church. Yeah. Yeah. Is some of what we read a code name for the church, or is it maybe literally speaking of a woman? Yeah. Well, it doesn't sound like talking about a woman per se. Uh, the, 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 I understand that I'm not an expert on Hebrew, but I understand that the Hebrew word for wisdom is feminine. So, but it does seem to suggest that God is challenging us to seek wisdom. It's not some unattainable goal or something that, you know, the average person doesn't have any access to in any way. Um, well, look at some of the comparisons between Proverbs 8 and Proverbs 31. Um, there are some very similar passages. Let me just pick a couple, and then I'll mention some of the comparisons. Look at Proverbs 31, verse 10. We started off with that. How hard it is to find a capable wife. She is worth far more than jewels. And if you compare with that, Proverbs 8, 35, it says, Those who find me, talking about wisdom, find life, and the Lord will be pleased with them. That's similar, isn't it? Her worth is far more than rubies. We already read Proverbs 31, 1, but look at Proverbs 8, verses 10 and 11. Choose my instruction instead of silver. Choose knowledge rather than the finest gold. I am wisdom. I am better than jewels. Nothing you want can compare with me. So she's worth more than rubies. In other places, it's going on down, she provides food. She is strong. She is wise. She is praised. Many comparisons in these two chapters. Um, and if you would like to see the, the handouts that we prepare for our lessons here, they're available to you. You can find them on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So we've asked before, and I'm going to ask for one more time here in our final lesson on Proverbs, what is the relationship between knowledge and wisdom? Are they related or not related? What do they mean by savvy, when somebody has a lot of savvy? That, that's another word for wisdom, probably, or at least most people would think it's a word for wisdom. So it's not necessarily just knowing a lot, it's, it's having some sort of second... Um, Using it properly. Feel, yeah, for doing what's right. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of knowledge and not necessarily have a whole lot of wisdom. Yeah. We live in an information age, and I when I'm eating sometimes, because I almost never watch TV unless I'm eating, um, I watch the program Jeopardy. Yeah. And these people who come on that program have their minds stuffed full of the, some of the craziest stuff you can imagine. Why in the world do people waste their time? I mean, not to be critical of somebody else's program, but man. They, and then, then they ask a question about the Bible and nobody has the answer, even fairly simple questions. But I, th I think hopefully, as you get older, supposedly, and I think it does happen as you get older in life experience, I think you do generate some wisdom. And then there's that biblical text, I can't think of the reference, of honor the hoary head. Mm -hmm. It's got something to do with wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Well, unfortunately, it seems like as time goes by, as a general group, we as human beings, even though we live in the so-called information age, we seem to be becoming less and less wise. Martin Luther King once said, we have guided missiles and misguided men. Mm -hmm. Well, look at Proverbs, I'm sorry, look at 1 Corinthians 1.21 as talking about wisdom. For God and His wisdom made it impossible for people to know by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Why would he make a statement like that? There must be a difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Yeah. You have an example of that? Well, yeah. I'll, I'll, let me pick one from Paul's time. What, what if you just mentioned someone on a, you, if you were walking down the street in Paul's day in Rome or, or one of the large cities, and you said someone was crucified, what would come to their mind? Criminal, probably a traitor. This is, this is a criminal has been dealt with, and that person is most likely a traitor to the Roman government. So then you turn around and say, did you know that someone was crucified is now going to be the savior of the world? And they would say, what? 
I mean, it must have seemed completely crazy to them that someone who is crucified as a traitor to the Roman government could end up being the savior to a world. It was complete foolishness until you sort of learn the rest of the story and you understand what kind of a person Jesus was and what he did and what he came to teach us and the fact that he able, was able to ra raise himself from the dead. That changes the story a little bit, not just like any other Roman criminal. Well, coming back to our wise woman here in Proverbs 31, she was certainly not lazy. She was busy from early morning to late in the day, and most of what she did was very practical, right? She did a variety of things. Do you think many women were capable of doing that kind of stuff in her day? Or even had the opportunity to do that kind of stuff in her day? Most were spending every minute that they had just providing food for their, and maybe some clothing for their family. And caring for the children, which came in a bunches. Yeah. She was functioning on a wider horizon in her family. Yeah. And, well, it's interesting, though, that, that while this woman seems very praiseworthy, there's no mention of her worshiping, praying, uh, carrying out any kind of sacrifice. Does that mean that um, this lady wasn't really a serious Jew or Christian? No, I don't think so. Not necessarily. Probably he was more involved in that. Certainly if she was in the synagogue, it was in a women's place someplace else away from the men. Mm -hmm. Certainly she wouldn't fall into the category that some have described as so spiritually minded that they're no earthly good. <laughs> <laughs> Look at a couple of verses from the New Testament that might give us a clue how she would be judged. Look at Luke 16, verse 10. Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. Would you say this woman was careful and doing her thing and carefully doing everything she was supposed to? And I guess, um, what about Martha in the New Testament? How, what did Jesus have to say about her? Remember the verses in Luke 10, verses 38 to 40? As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him in her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat down at the feet of the Lord and listened to his teaching. Martha was upset over all the work she had to do, so she came and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself by myself? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled over so many things, but just one is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will not be taken away from her. And of course, what, what is he talking about? Talking about no dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So why didn't Solomon include something about meditation or prayer in this description of this wonderful woman? Well, remember, this is not written by Solomon. Oh, okay. Solomon. Might have been written Solomon. by Solomon's mother. Well, why didn't she? Well, that's a good question. Well, they didn't do it, did they? I mean, was we're... Was something that was just for men? That's what I was thinking. Well, remember that in, in their day, there was, a court for, there was a court for priests. Outside of that, there was a court for Hebrew men. And outside of that is a court for Hebrew women. And outside of that is a court for Gentiles. So the women didn't worship with the men, per se. Of course, the offering plates were, the offering big jars that they were supposed to put your offering in, were in the court for women. So you got to admit, if they didn't do their work, the men wouldn't be able to do their worshiping. No. Were the pagan religions used women to a large extent, didn't they? At least in New Testament yes. times, in the pagan temples, mm -hmm. well, Old Testament times too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that have something to do with it, or possibly? Yeah. Caused a contrast, that's for sure. Yeah. But whether that was the reason, might not. Maybe the question. Here's three verses I'm just picking out from Proverbs 31. What is this? If you read these three verses together, what does it say to us about this woman? I'm reading verse 12 and 15 and 18. As long as she lives, she does him good and never harm. That's her husband talking about her husband. She gets up before daylight to prepare food for her family and tell her servant women what to do. 
and then she knows the value of everything she makes and works late into the night. What does that tell you about this lady? She's rich. Yeah. Well, even to maintain their upper scale lifetime, it was still a very manual existence, even in your own home. She had to start early and work late. And she was not only caring for herself, it says specifically that she helped to take care of the poor and the yeah. neglected and the disabled, you know, disadvantaged. It doesn't she say how, sorry, she doesn't say, it doesn't say how many servants she had. Yeah. She could have had a whole lot. We don't know. There was probably a variable number there, but she still had to work. And to be wise, I mean, in light of the kind of wisdom we're talking about in here in Proverbs 31, she clearly had an eye to the future. I mean, she's buying and she's selling and she's preparing and she's clothing her family for winter. So this is a lady who understands the preparing for the future means you understand the consequences of what you're doing, right? So uh, how, how many of us could remember a, a wife or a mother or a female relative of some kind or a teacher or a boss or a friend who has had a great influence on us and has been of tremendous benefit to us personally? My mother. Probably every one of us. Good question, yeah. Yeah. What's the best way to show appreciation to women like that? Jewelry. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> <praying>. <laughs> Give well, there, there's, there's <laughs> clearly some women who would appreciate that. Uh, flowers, a lot of women appreciate flowers. Well, I think we should undoubtedly honor them, but we also should make, make sure that her needs are taken care yeah. of. And often they're not, certainly in our day and age. In our day, it's a, it's a really nice thing to take them out to eat once in a while, too, yeah. so they don't have to prepare all the food. We certainly need to verbalize to them frequently. Yes, definitely. As they do to us. Yes. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Jim? No, I'm, not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to. I, I was fortunate to have a godly mother, and I was fortunate to have two godly grandmothers. Um, and I've looked back, you do look back as you get older, and I often wonder where I might have been without those women. Not that I'm. Mm -hmm downgrading my dad, but there was a difference. And uh, I th I've, a lot of my friends went out of the church, and mm -hmm. but for what I was lucky enough to have, I might have done the same too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This makes me think of my mom as well, because my mother had 10 children, and she too, she did all that. And we had the house in the back had a huge bakery, and after people would come and take the thing and put on there to go sell the ones that were, you know, that stayed, my mom would give it to people who had nothing. Yeah. And, you know, she raised, we have, I have five brothers who've never been arrested in their lives. You always hear, oh, you have this and that. We've never had that kind of problems. Everybody was raised in church. Everybody, you know, became somebody. Yes. And I, the only mess up, <laughs> messed up, I got married at 15. <laughs> and kind of derail a little bit, but my mom was a fantastic person. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think uh, this woman in Proverbs 31 would survive in the judgment we read about in Matthew 25? You remember this passage. When the Son of Man comes as King and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne and the people of all the nations will gather before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come, you that are blessed by my father, come and possess the kingdom which has prepared, been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me drink, a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me in prison and you visited me. And then, of course, he talks about the other side. So where do you think this lady would end up in that judgment? I think she would do very well. Yes. Yeah. Well, we need to praise women like that, um, but we need to take action sometimes as well. So many women in our day seem to think that only their outward appearance is what matters. Charm and beauty seem to be the ultimate goal in their lives, but the charm and beauty are fleeting. They don't last forever. A woman's true beauty is what is inside, not just what is outside. As Ellen White put it in Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 578, 
A great name among men is as letters traced in sand, but a spotless character will endure to all eternity. So we haven't mentioned anything about single people in this discussion. Do you think that um, some of the things it says in this chapter about this wonderful wife and mother could apply to single people, maybe male and female as well? Of course. Single yeah. parents, yeah. a lot of single parents do all that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. What are we doing to improve our effectiveness, our characters, and our relationship to God? Well, going, thinking about our first part of our lesson again, look at this paragraph from Mellon White. When indulging their appetite for wine and while under its exciting stimulus, their reason, talking about Nadab and Abihu, was clouded and they could not discern the difference between the sacred and the common. Contrary to God's express direction, they dishonored him by offering common instead of sacred fire. God visited them with his wrath. Fire went forth from his presence and destroyed them. So that's one extreme from this chapter. And here's the opposite. Let the children and youth learn from the Bible how God has honored the work of the everyday toiler. Let them read of the wise woman described in the Proverbs who seeketh wool and flax, worketh willingly with her hands, who giveth meat to her household and their tasks to her maidens, and meat there is the word for food, who planteth a vineyard and strengtheneth her arms, who reaches forth her hands to the needy, who looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Proverbs 31, 13, and 15, and that's in Education, page 217. Well, now let's let's think about applying some of these words to our situation in our day. Would you say that Proverbs thirty one is in direct conflict with the what people many people consider to be the values of our society today? Very much so. If you if you think that the good life is wine, women, and song, then you'd have problems with Proverbs thirty one, right? Well, think of how many lives would be saved if people would stop drinking alcohol. Oh. Thousands and thousands yeah, every year. It's immeasurable if you take it on a world scale. Mm -hmm. I won't forget the time I was working in a very, very rural area in Africa. In fact, so rural that during the rainy season it was completely cut off. You couldn't even go there in the, in the rainy season. And we were there, it was just, a, the rainy season was about to start. And so we were down, going down one of these little old dirt roads and wondering how long it would be before the dirt road would be cut off and they wouldn't be able to get through anymore. I was driving a long wheelbase Land Rover. And we came o over a little hill. Unfortunately, I saw this guy. It was, it, it was night. It was dark. Jammed on my brakes. And here was a guy just sprawled out right across the middle of the road. And there was his bicycle over in the ditch. And I thought, you know, maybe this guy's dead. So I stopped and jumped out, left the lights shining on him, and jumped out, went over there, and banged on his face, and tried to pinch him, and finally I got him to wake up just a little bit, to move, and so forth like this, and, you know, tried to get him to talk, I said, can we help you? Oh, no, 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 can we help you go home? No, 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 I have to ride my bicycle, well, we'll see if we can put you, no, 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 so he absolutely refused us to do anything, so finally, I, I, I let him go, and he woke up enough. So he, he got on his bicycle and started weaving down the road again. I said, okay, we'll drive past you. <laughs> I don't know whether he ba ended up back in the ditch again, but man, just four plus bad news. You, you know, the trouble with alcohol, it is a bottle of feeling good. Mm -hmm. And sin itself is, mm -hmm. puts on people bad feelings. Mm -hmm. I mean, they... I mean, you get depressed, you want to die, you want to do all this stuff, and then that bottle is there to start, you know, to tempt you to take it so you can feel good. So, you know, it's not just the alcohol that's doing it. It's, it's something else that's driving it to be that way, too. So I'm not quite sure if you just got rid of all the alcohol that, that all the problems would be over with. No, no, but probably most of the deaths would be prevented. Well, I don't know. Some people might get terribly mad and start. Well, but 
alcohol. Yeah, kill in that direction too. But I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Alcohol affects more than just the brain and the mm -hmm. liver. It, it's, it's like smoking. It affects everything. It yeah. is more specific in certain areas, but you would cut down a lot of ill health if you could turn that You'll have milk. a lot of people that don't feel very good and they'll want to well, kill somebody, and you want to do this. They certainly don't feel good the next morning after they had a lot too much to drink. You well, know, that's not my point. My point <laughs> is that it's there, yeah. ready to take. Yeah. And the, the, the devil tempts them to take it. And well, it's just... In our, in our lifetime, the only basic reason it is there in a lot of ways is the duty that the governments get off it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to be Cold really taxation. cynical... Yeah. Well, this virtuous woman, going back to her again, in this chapter got plenty of exercise. She did a lot of things even with her own hands. She was a tremendous benefit to her household, to her husband, to her children, and even to the poor and needy that surrounded her. We started out the book of Proverbs by talking about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. Would a true reverence for God lead us to develop the kind of behaviors and lifestyle portrayed in Proverbs 31? Yeah. Now, we didn't mention this woman doing any special religious exercises, but what about that? I, you think, think? I think it's part of bringing kids up. We've all been brought up to respect and what have you, and, and uh, getting involved with God never hurts. Pretty okay, much. let's think about this for a moment. The motivating force in Satan's kingdom is selfishness. Mm -hmm. Do you think all this, well, I know we, I, I, we should mention the obvious, the motivating force in God's kingdom is love. You care about other people. So do you think this woman was motivated by selfishness or by love? I love and doing the right I thing. Think so. Yeah, absolutely. She loved her family. She cared for them. She even loved the people she worked for. She loved the, the poor and the needy. She cared for them. I mean, this, this woman is a great example of the kind of person God's looking for. Yeah. Well, throughout this book, especially starting back in the first part of the book, young men were warned against the dangers of strange women and the ruinous effects that can result from their seductive powers. What a contrast to that we see in this final chapter. Just think how different this is than the woman is out there on the street. You remember chapter, I think it's five, trying to seduce a guy who's walking down the street. This woman was not only a blessing to herself and to those around her, but a blessing to her husband. And he in turn blessed her. Now, some people will read the King James Version of Proverbs 31, 11, and 12 and think that the husband was sort of sitting around doing nothing. What, what was the husband doing? Do you remember? Let me read you from the King James here. I think, I, or actually, I've got the New American Standard up here. Sitting in the gates with the yeah, businessman. Okay. Um, where is my verse here? Verse 23. 23, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. Mm -hmm. He's just over there chewing the fat, right? Not really. Not really? To support his household, he had to be probably a merchant of some kind. Yes. And, and what did the merchants he's do? He's got his feelers out to where the people that he does trade with or buys things for his family. If you, if you visit the ruins of any of these ancient cities, you'll find that they have big, fairly wide, and gates with, with hard doors on them, and then there'll be a, 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 an area, another more or less blockage area, and it's something like this. And these are places where people would meet and sit down and do business. Yeah. So this guy is doing business. The, sitting in the city gates is not a matter of, well, I'm just sitting here and chewing the fat with the guys. No, this is where, I mean, there were no phones, there, were no, there was no internet, there was no, nothing like that. You, this is the place you have to go if you, if you needed to see somebody. The modern term is networking. Yes, the so modern term is networking. It. That's exactly right. This is also a place that the form of government or deciding cases, judicial yep. uh, yeah. judgments and so on would have been made. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another com couple more comments from Ellen White. The Lord has served as much a more 
by faithful home work than by the one who teaches the word. As verily as do the teachers in the school, farmers, fathers and mothers, not farmers, fathers and mothers are to feel that they are the educators of their children. Manuscript 32, 1899. The Christian mother's sphere of usefulness should not be narrowed by her domestic life. The salutary influence which she exerts on the home circle, she may and will make felt in more widespread usefulness in her neighborhood and in the church of God. Home is not a prison to the devoted wife and mother. It was first written in the Health Reformer, June 1, 1887, paragraph 6. Uh, now you can find it in the Adventist Home, page 236. And another one. The influence of an ill-regulated family is widespread and disastrous to all society. It accumulates in a tide of evil that affects families, communities, and governments. It is impossible for any of us to live in such a way that we shall not cast an influence on the world. No member of the family can close himself within himself where other members of the family shall not feel his influence and spirit. The very expression of the countenance has an influence for good or evil. His spirit, his words, his actions, his attitude toward others are unmistakable. If he is living in selfishness, and whose kingdom is that? That's Satan's kingdom. He surrounds his soul with a malarious atmosphere. While if he is filled with the love of Christ, he will manifest courtesy, kindness, tender regard for the feelings of others, and will communicate to his associates by his act of love a tender, grateful, happy feeling. It will be made manifest that he is living for Jesus and daily learning lessons at his feet. Receiving his light and his peace, he will be able to say to, it, to the Lord, Thy gentleness have made me great. Adventist Psalm 33 and 34. So, in the few seconds we have left, looking back over the book of Proverbs, we should recognize that it's full of practical wisdom. True religion has a very practical aspect. How can you make sure that our lives are a blessing to those around us as well as preparing us for home in heaven? Proverbs clearly points to a reverence that we each should have for the Creator God. That also implies that we should regard all human beings as our brothers and sisters, and therefore treat them like family, treat them as nicely as this woman we read about in the last part of Proverbs 31 did, care for them, love them, and we will be judged well in the kingdom of heaven. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for being with us through this first lesson together. We thank you for the wisdom that you have provided for us to study. May we do well by it as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.